so when we share the good news, we need to, it's important that we remember that the good news is Jesus, not the culture in which uh, he necessarily lived. This type of evangelism is what we see Paul doing as he goes into Athens on this particular trip that he's on, and he's proclaiming to them about Jesus Christ. And so as we read and we look at Acts 17, we see Paul there in Athens. And Paul had gone to Athens because he had been forced to flee from Thessalonica and Berea. And so he ended up in Athens. Now Athens was the, the, the staple of Greek culture. That was the place where Greek culture was seen quite, uh, quite largely. It was renowned for its Greek art and for the Greek philosophy that came out of the Greek culture. And some of the most, most famous of philosophers lived in Athens. Uh, if you've read any Greek philosophy, you probably read from uh, philosophers that were uh, there within Athens during the time of Paul. Athens was also the home of almost every man-made god that existed in time. The pagan writer Petronius, he once said this about Athens. He said, it's easier to find a god in Athens than it is to find a man. Now think about it. It's easier to find a god than it is to find a man. That's a lot of gods. And so in fact, in Athens, there was a large uh, bunch of idolatry going on that drove Paul to this wanting to preach the, the gospel of Jesus Christ in Athens. He was distressed by all the idolatry and the worship of so many different gods that he found within uh, the Greek uh, culture. In a customary Paul fashion, he marches directly into the local synagogues and was reasoning with the, the scriptures and talking with all of the, the Jewish and the God-fearing Gentiles that he could find within the community and in the marketplace. And every day he was there, he was there talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so here he is, he's going through the temples and the marketplace. And some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers that were within the Greek uh, culture of Athens at that time, they heard Paul in the marketplace talking about Jesus Christ. Take this off, kind of hold it, maybe that will help. Um, he was there in the marketplace and he was talking about God. And some of those philosophers heard Paul talking about God. And as he was talking about it, they were thinking, you know, this guy might be an interesting kind of guy when, uh, just for us to hear. Now you see, in, in that time, um, they, the philosophers in Athens, they liked to find people who were talking about things that might spark their imagination. And so they would often bring people in to talk uh, that, that, were, uh, that um, had novel ideas that they wanted to hear more about. And this was what was happening during that time. Here Paul had been in, in Athens and these philosophers come along and they asked him to come up to the Areopagus, which is up on Mars Hill, this temple where all of the philosophers gather together. And so he, they, he, they ask him to come. He says, simply going to be a novelty, someone to talk to them about something that might amuse them and give them something to, to talk about that's new in the, in the world. And so this is where we find Paul at, at the time of this reading that we're talking about here in Acts 17. He, he's getting ready. He's, he's been invited up to the Areopagus, and here he is. He comes in gets up to talk, and he talks to them, and so he, his message, his way of confronting this godless culture that he's in, Paul proceeds to give them an example um, for how we, we, he gives us an example of how we can connect to people who don't necessarily know or understand God, and so he begins with the passage by complimenting the Athenians. When, when he says this, he says, you know, uh, Athenians, I see that you are very religious in every way. He's, he's been walking around the community. He's been looking at everything that's been going on. And he experiences as he walks around all of these temples, all of these statues to these many gods. And he says, for I have walked around and carefully observed your objects of 
worship. I have even discovered an altar upon which is inscribed to the unknown God. Now Paul uses that inscription, this unknown God, the statue of this unknown God that he sees, to come in as a point of departure to talk about the one true God. He, he comes in and he says, that which you worship in ignorance, this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. I'm going to tell you about this God that you see as unknown because I know this God and I'm going to tell you about him. And that he wants to take this worship, this object of worship, this unknown, the, the, to making him a personal God. Not a what, but a whom that they should be praising and worshiping. So who was this God? He's the creator of the world, Paul tells them, which is immediately different from all of the gods that the Athenians worshipped. In the Greek pantheon, they, all of these gods, they were man-made gods. They were, were gods who, who had been created, and they, they were dependent upon the humans that worshipped them. Now, our God, neither was he dependent upon human beings, Paul says, nor is he dependent upon anything, for he is the one who has created all of this earth. Rather than needing help, God is the one who is guiding the history that you see before you. And then Paul moves to talk about and states for them that God has made humans in such a way that we, are, we yearn for him and we seek after him. And by the time, by the time of ignorance has passed, and this unknown God that you have been worshiping, now you know who He is. This is no longer an unknown God. This is the God of the Hebrews, the God of creation, the one true God. Now we see Paul doing that in his speech to the Areopagus, and Paul's Paul's argument is pivoting not on the Old Testament quotations but rather on a citation of cultural uh, authorities within the Greek culture. We too are his offspring, he tells them. Even your poets tell us this. And so when Paul is talking to them, he's talking to them about the, these, these sources that they've all read and heard and know about. Paul tells them of, of poetry, um, and Paul is quoting works from a Sicilian poet named Erastus. Now Paul was from Tarsus, which is a part of Sicily. So he was well aware of Erastus' poetry. And so he quotes from this poet uh, from Sicily who talks about, for we truly are his offspring. Now he's talking about Zeus, and he, he's talking about Zeus in his poet, but Paul takes that and he moves that and transforms it and reimagines it to help them understand that, that, that it's not Zeus, it is the one true God. We are his offspring. And then there's another poem from Cleanthes called The Hymn to Zeus, which kind of reads like this. And if you listen, it kind of sounds a lot like our God. Oh God, most glorious, called by many a name, nature's great king, through endless years the same, omnipotence, who by thy just decree controllest all. Hail Zeus, for unto thee behooves thy creatures in all lands to call. We are thy children, we alone of all. Now we can just as easily substitute God in there where it says, Hail Zeus. This is the God that you are worshiping. It's not Zeus. Paul says it's not Zeus, it's God. It's the Hebrew God, this God who created all that there is here that you are worshiping. Now, Paul, he had no problem quoting this material and these ideas that were produced by the pagans in honor of good gods like Zeus. He takes these principles, these words that they've spoken, and he shows them the relationship between them and the one true God. He applies them to the ideas and our beliefs about the one true God. But such maxims, Paul is not suggesting that God is in any way like Zeus uh, of the Greek pan, uh, polytheism or sort of pantheism, but that he is rather the one true God that rules over all the earth and that they should truly be worshiping. He is arguing that the poets, his hearer, these hearers, they recognize that they were, these people would recognize as authorities have to some extent, you know, been truly thinking about the one true God, even though 
He speaks and he disinfects and rebaptizes the words of the poets and the means of their Greek culture for his purposes to draw them nearer to the God of the Hebrews. We are God's offspring, created in God's image. Now we as, the, we as God's people know those messages from Genesis. But God, bring, uh, God calls Paul to use the words of these poets and the, these authorities within Greek culture to show them that this is the same thing that God has told the Hebrew people that he created us as mankind, that we are his offspring and are made in his image. Now some of these ancient philosophers, they had an understanding of a one true supreme God. And they actually understood that, and in some cultures that was an embedded belief. But that the same scene itself is playing out within the Athenian culture. This God cannot be known directly was what they, these philosophers thought. But Paul came to tell them that yes, you can know this God, and I have known this God. Now he comes to them, and he talks to them, and he presents this truth, and he presents it through these, these authorities of Greek culture. Here it is the basis of Paul's attack on their idolatry. He says, we are God's offspring. So if you understand us to be the offspring of a God, and I'm telling you we are the offspring of this one true God, then thus, Humans are the true image of God. Therefore, no image you make of a God by your own personal skill or your own creativity can it possibly be anything like the God that you are worshiping. Because we are his image. And when we make those graven images, we are distorting the image of the one true God. And so he calls them on these images that they worship. And Paul does, doesn't make this address referring to Jewish history or to quoting Jewish scripture. He knew that that would have been futile to talk to these Greeks about what it was that was going on in Jewish scripture and Jewish prophecy. He knew that that argument would have failed. He could not, they would, they wouldn't have known about the fulfillments of prophecies or been interested in it. And he didn't quote from books that none of them had read or accepted as authority. He went to the sources that they saw as authoritative in their own culture. In his letter to the Corinthian church, Paul wrote, I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel. Paul wanted to get that message out to as many people as he could in whatever way he could, so that he could bring them closer to God and to the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He illustrates this principle here in Acts 17 when he draws on them his knowledge of Greek culture to try and build a bridge between Greek culture and the God of, of the Jewish people. He wants them to see how things they have been reading and writing in everyday life that they are actually bits and pieces of the truth of this God that they should be worshiping, propelling them toward this God that, that, that they can know and not just an unknown God. As John Calvin once wrote later, he said, all truth is from God. And consequently, if wicked men have said anything that is true and just, we ought not to reject it, for it has come from God. Even the wicked can speak pieces of truth that we can use to bring people closer to God. The proclamation of the church reflects a recognition that while Jesus is the truth, there is also truth out there that can be used to point people to Jesus Christ. That is what Paul was doing with the people of Athens. He was using the, the pieces in their culture to point them towards the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ. Now Paul defers uh, the subject of resurrection to the very last of his message. And he does that because the proclamations of the resurrection of the dead were ones that were highly contested in the early church. 
but it is the, cop, the, the culmination of every proclamation of our belief in Jesus Christ. And so Paul ends his communication with the, them at the Areopagus, talking about Jesus Christ, who has been raised by God and will come to judge those here on this earth. In our culture today, where people believe in some sort of nebulous life after death, a resurrection isn't very shocking for most people. But during the time of the early church, a belief in resurrection was not common. They did not believe in resurrection. Greeks believed in the immortality of the soul, but they didn't believe in the immortality of the body. They did not believe in a spiritual body, as Paul believed. And so to them, the resurrection of the body seemed absurd and somewhat morbid. Um, and so as it turns out, the resurrection as well as the cross, they weren't uh, effective in trying to bring these leaders closer to the Christian faith. And even within Judaism, there were those who did not believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. Uh, they believed that you lived and you died, and that's all there was to life. And so even within his own Jewish faith, there were those who struggled to understand and to believe in the resurrection. Understandably, no amount of trying to Hellenize the concept of the resurrection of the dead would have been palatable to these Athenians. And so Paul doesn't even try. He simply brings it up in the last of his message. And, and the specifically Christian part of Paul's proclamation would have been a stumbling block. It would have taken him much, much, much longer to try and explain the concept of resurrection, which he does in, in other places. But this was not the place he, he felt that this was the battle he needed to pick. Nevertheless, the central tenet of Christianity is one that he spoke and addressed before them, even knowing that they would not believe in the resurrection. The nature and the meaning of that resurrection is something that we have to continue we keep promoting out in the world and proclaiming to our world. It is, nece it is necessary for us to continue to confront those who find the resurrection unbelievable or want to deny Christ's resurrection. For it is a central tenet of what we believe as Christians in Christ's resurrection from death. People's reactions to the gospel there in Athens will always, were, were always the same as what they will be no matter where we are in the world. You see, people are going to react in one of three ways to the message of the gospel. They're either going to receive it, or they're going to be reluctant about it, or they're going to reject it. Those are the three ways that we always, no matter where we are, will see people react to the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. In Athens, people like Dionysus and Amaris, they were exemplifying uh, the proper response in receiving the message of Jesus Christ that Paul was sharing with them. And here's the significance of that. Dionysus happened to be one of the most revered men in Athens at that time. He had a home in, at, on the Areopagus, which was a large hill. And so after Paul left and went back to Corinth, it was Dionysus who talk, took Paul's message of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and in time, he brought the whole city to faith in Jesus Christ. A plaque stands on the Areopagus even today that reads like this. So sometime in the middle of the first century AD, the apostle Paul is said to have converted a number of Athenians by teaching the tenets of a new religion from the summit of the hill. Among the converts was Dionysus, the patron saint of the city of Athens, who according to the tradition was the city's first bishop. Remains of a church in his honor are preserved on the northern slope of the hill. Now Paul, when he came to Athens, he dared to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ in opposition to the wisdom of the culture of that day, to the wisdom of the world around him. And, and at least that day, you would have thought that Paul failed because there were not many who listened to him. But there were a few who believed. And there were a few who wanted to hear more about what Paul had to say. He planted seeds those that day that continued to grow and to bear fruit even unto this day that have continued to spread the message of Jesus Christ throughout the world. 
And so the, the, the question for us is, are we willing to be like Paul and to spread the, plant, uh, the, the seed, to plant the seed of Jesus Christ in all those around us that we know do not believe? Are we ready to imitate Paul? Amen. Okay, so your questions for this week. While modern day idolatry may not look like making sacrifices in, different, in front of different statues or different altars, that doesn't mean that idolatry doesn't exist. So how do we know if something has become an idol in our lives? Think about what might have become an idol in your life. Repentance is the way we begin our relationship with God, but it's also the way that we grow in our relationship with God. So is there anything in our lives that we need to be repentant about? And people today want their points of view heard uh, by in, in as many means as possible. So they try gaining hearing through websites and through blogs and through picking <laughs> and media publications and all kinds of other means. So how might we gain a hearing of our message about Jesus Christ with those who have not been reached with the message of Jesus? And are there parts of Paul's message that we can use to spark interest in someone who doesn't know about Jesus?